Happy Marriage and all glories to Vaishnavas online. So welcome back devotees to this afternoon session. This afternoon we are blessed to have His Grace Ruta Bhavana Das. Ruta Bhavana Das has always been there for us. All we have to do is ask Ruta Bhavana to be at our disciple meeting and with our heartbeat he's ready to say his share his transcendental knowledge so for that Buddha Bhavana thank you it's lovely to have you here with us as always devotees if we can ask you to have your microphones on mute also if you have your cameras off this will allow for less interruption while Buddha Bhavana Prabhu is speaking also this time if you have questions please can you direct them to asha mataji who will then collate the questions and we can ask buddha bhavana at the end of the session so buddha bhavana thank you and everybody please welcome buddha bhavana Hare krishna Hare krishna okay so everyone can hear me clearly I'm sure the organizers will tell me if that's not the case. So what we'll do is we'll say prayers first, and then we'll speak a little bit around Rupa Goswami's definition of pure devotional service, as given in the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu. Okay, so let's say prayers and we can go from there. Magyana Tamarandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chakshu Militamyena Tasmai Shri Guravena Maha Shri Chaitanya Manobishtam Stapitam yena bhutale, swayam rupa kadamayam, dadati swapadantikam, bandeham, shri guru, shri yuta padakamalam, shri gurun vaishnavamscha, shri rupam sagrajatam, sahagana raganatam vitam tuam sajivam, sadvaitam savadutam, parijana sahitam, krishna chaitanya devam, Shri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Lalita Shri Visha Kamvitamscha Hey Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostate Tapta Kanchana Gorangi Radhe Vrindavaneshwari Vrishabhanu Sutta Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Pancha kalpa turbias cha, kripa sindhu bia eva cha, patita nam pavane bio, vaishnave bio namo namaha, Sri Krishna Chaitanya, Prabhu Nityananda, Sri Advaita Gadadara, Sri Vasadi Gorabhakta Vrinda, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama Hare Hare. So, um, I just want to begin by saying um, thank you to His Holiness Chandamuli Maharaj. Thank you to all the assembled Vaishnavas for allowing us to say something in this wonderful um, retreat, Disciples Retreat and Well Wishes Retreat online. Um, I'll, I'll begin by requesting all of your blessings so we can speak in a way that will be pleasing to the Guru Parampara to Srila Prabhupada. And um, yeah, we'll speak for, let's say, an hour, hour 15 or so. And then we'll open up for whatever questions that you have. And then we'll just see how we go forward from there. So we're speaking about the definition of pure devotional service given by Rupa Goswami. And this definition is really powerful for a number of reasons. It helps us to understand what is bhakti, you know, what is, what is pure bhakti. It helps us to understand those who are engaged in pure bhakti, the pure bhaktas or bhaktins, those who are engaged in that activity. And it helps us to understand how to please Bhagavan, Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So as we understand this definition, given by Rupa Goswami, one of the great and pure devotees in our line, a Nitya Siddha associate of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, it can benefit us in a number of ways. It can help us to have a keener eye in terms of what we're trying to achieve in this devotional service. It can help us, along with that appreciation of what we're trying to achieve, 
It can help us to be more focused in the execution of our pure devotional service. And ultimately, it can help us to please Bhagavan, to please Krishna, and therefore fulfill the entire goal of our existence in, not just in this material world, but in, in every existence that we've ever had in the material universes. It can bring us to the point that we actually understand why we're here, what we're meant to be doing, and can engage in that activity with more enthusiasm, more expertise, and more understanding. And these three ingredients coming together, enthusiasm, expertise, and understanding, they can literally help us to accelerate our devotion towards the goal of love of Godhead. Okay, so there's a lot of very powerful content that through the mercy of Srila Prabhupada and his followers, we've been given the great fortune of coming across. And we want to explore that a little bit. I will also advise you, as we're going through this discussion, try to think about what this means for you. Try to think about or latch on to things that you think, okay, that could be a useful thing for me to meditate on. It could be useful for me to understand more about so that I can not only improve in my devotion to Krishna, but because devotion to Krishna is a reciprocal relationship, it allows me also to more deeply enter into the mystery of devotional life and experience the loving reciprocation between Krishna and his devotees. As Krishna says, Yeyatamam prapadyante tamsateva bhajami aham mama vatmanivatate manusya pavasavashaha. Ultimately, we're trying to live our lives and gain an understanding which will make us move forward in devotional life more and more enthusiastically, more fully, and more sincerely. So through that enthusiasm, that sincere endeavor, we'll, we'll be more deeply experiencing the realities of devotion. And as we experience more deeply the realities of devotion, we're able to more deeply imbibe it ourselves and also give it to others. So let's start here. So there's a consideration, uh, actually, let me put it this way. I was, I was speaking to the South African devotees. So they, they're doing this online retreat. And they asked me, what would you want to speak on? So I said, I'll speak upon the story of you. And we were explaining how life itself has, has a story. It has a narrative. It has a journey that it's taking everyone on. And that journey has a purpose. As is explained within our teachings, the entire purpose of human existence is to understand who I am, who is Krishna, and to engage in loving devotional service to him. So we were explaining to them that this is the idea, the story of you, that ultimately life is about cultivating one specific divine relationship. And that relationship is the relationship between the jiva, the living entity, and the supreme personality of Godhead. So what is the essence of all relationship though? What is it that makes one able to establish a relationship between ourselves and someone else? The essence of a relationship is service. Service is the active ingredient in all relationships. And the better the quality of the service, the more stable, deep, and meaningful the quality of the relationship also is. So as we discuss this Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu and the definition of pure devotional service given therein, we will also discuss what are considered to be the primary characteristics of pure devotional service. We'll also discuss what are the secondary characteristics of pure devotional service. And we'll elaborate on some of the subtle meanings behind the definition that is given by Rupa Goswami. But let's put this in this whole um, definition within context. So between the departure of Krishna from the earth some 5,000 years ago and the advent of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu around 500 years ago, 
the science of pure devotional service was almost lost. So due to the influence of Kali Yuga, there were many different forms of a semblance of devotion. There were many different types of fabricated devotion. And, and what was considered the, the, the real devotion, the pure devotion, was considered to be mixed up amongst all of these other things. So people weren't clear on what pure devotional service actually was. So most of humanity at that time had no access to the teachings of pure devotional service. And the very few individuals who were interested in pure devotional service were misled by ignorant or deviant understandings of what pure devotional service actually was. So Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu revived the science of pure devotional service, first by his example, but also by his teachings. And he instructed his followers to record his teachings in terms of pure devotional service. And it's interesting because he understood also that what, we, what was going on in Kali Yuga at that time was very different to the past. In the past, there was an oral tradition. So there was this term Shruti Das. People were so powerful that they could understand and capture knowledge just by hearing and hold that knowledge within their consciousness. But understanding that that, that tradition of oral reception and passing on of wisdom was, was basically shattered. He empowered his own followers, people like Rupa Goswami, Sanatana Goswami, to write the bhakti scriptures. And Rupa Goswami wrote the most authoritative guide to pure devotional service, which was called the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu. And in that Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, we find this definition that we're gonna explore which is a definition of pure devotional service as given by Rupa Goswami in the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu 1, 1, 11. And this, this definition is also quoted in the Chaitani Charitamrita Madhya Leela, chapter 19, text num number 167. So we're going to explore that in a moment. But before we do, we also want to understand that in our journey in the material world, the fact that we've come to the point where we have been exposed to this teaching, that is a very, very rare and very fortunate milestone in our journey. So when we are thinking about this, we're trying to understand a few things. One is our extraordinary good fortune. Our extraordinary good fortune in being exposed to the essential truth for which every single living entity in every single universe is literally meant to understand. So if you can consider that we've been in the material world for billions of lifetimes, the fact that someone is exposed to Krishna consciousness is a, is a very deep and extraordinary stroke of luck. It is a very deep and extraordinary um, advent of divine mercy. Now, the point is, what do we do with that mercy? Okay. It is very interesting to consider that Krishna loves all of his parts and parcels. As he explains in the Bhagavad Gita, he has no favorites. Samoham Sava Bhute Shu. He's equal and kind to everyone. So then the question is, the question is one of reciprocation. And as we understand what pure devotional service is, we can reciprocate better. With the, with the love and affection of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And we can therefore develop and cultivate our devotion in order to return to that place where devotion is the norm, to that place where every living entity is purely wrapped in loving devotion to Krishna in association of Krishna's other pure devotees and are experiencing eternal fulfillment, eternal ecstasy, in the service of the Supreme Lord. Okay? So Krishna is very soft-hearted. When Krishna hears the sincere appeal of his devotees, his heart melts. In fact, he, it is said that he cannot ignore the slightest trace of devotion. So what to speak of someone who engages in, in a genuine submission and surrender to Krishna? And in our, in our devotional line, Krishna is empowering us 
He empowers his devotees by his instructions and by the instructions of Krishna through the medium of his pure devotees, we gain the strength to become able to withstand the, um, the attacks of Maya, the attacks of the material energy. By the instructions of the Lord, through his pure devotees, we're able to purify our hearts by engaging in activities which are, which are saturated with a mood of surrender and a mood of a devotion. And by Krishna's greats coming through his devotees, we're able to move closer to him by giving the insight, and I love the point that Marge made earlier, about association. Literally by the association that we keep, association of certain individuals, association of the holy name, association of the teachings. By this type of association, we're literally choosing our destiny, choosing the direction that our life is moving in. And all of these things make us rich in that devotion, which is going to allow us to achieve the goal of life itself. Okay, so we want to talk about this particular definition. So as we said, this is the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, verse, um, so one one eleven, And it's a very famous verse that many of you will know. I'll just re repeat it, and then I'll repeat um, the word for word. And then we're going to start to break down some of the key um, points around this definition. So Rupa Goswami writes, Anya Bilasata Shunyam, Jnana Karma Dhanavritam. Anukul yena krishna nu shilanam bhakti utama. So synonyms. Anya bilasata shunyam, which is translated as without desires, other than those for the service of Lord Krishna, or without material desires, in brackets, such as those for meat eating, illicit sex, gambling, and addiction to intoxications. This is from this is how Prabhupada breaks it down in the Chaitanya Charitamrita Madhya Lila 19, text number 167. Then Jnana, it says here, by the knowledge of the philosophy of the monists, Mayavadis, karma, by fruitive activities, Adi, by artificially practicing detachment, by the mechanical practice of yoga, by studying the Sankhya philosophy, and so on. Anabritam, says, unco not, unco not covered, sorry. Anukuyena, favorable, Krishna Nusilanam, or Krishna Anushilanam, cultivation of service in relationship to Krishna, Bhakti Uttama, first class devotional service. So translation, when first class devotional service develops, one must be devoid of all material desires. Knowledge obtained by monist philosophy and fruitive action. The devotee must constantly serve Krishna favorably as Krishna desires. Okay. And, and Prabhupada, interestingly enough, in the Nectar of Devotion, he summarizes devotional service. He says to prosecute Krishna conscious activities that are favorable to the transcendental pleasure of the Supreme Lord. Okay. So, this is a definition given by Rupa Goswami. And this definition is extremely powerful and significant for a number of reasons. Let's start here. So Rupa Goswami uses this term Uttama Bhakti, which is translated as first class devotional service. And one of the reasons why he does this is because in using that term, he distinguishes the teachings of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's movement from the cheating religions that popularized impure forms of devotion at the time of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's presence on the earth. Bhaktivinoda Thakur says something very interesting in relation to this. He says that just as a person says, here is some pure water, to distinguish pure water from contaminated water, in the same way, Rupa Goswami speaks of pure devotion, of first class devotion, to differentiate first class devotion, and we'll explore this in a bit more detail, to differentiate first class devotion from mixed devotional service. Now what Rupa Goswami defines as first class devotion, Uttama, is also the same thing that is mentioned in other scriptures within our bhakti tradition. 
right? So in our scriptures, it talks about Kevala Bhakti, so exclusive devotion. It will speak about Ananya Bhakti, unalloyed devotion. It will speak about Akinchana Bhakti, untainted devotion. And it sometimes will speak about Shuddha Bhakti, pure devotional and pure devotion as well. So all of these points are coherent with the conclusions of our scripture. And, and it's very interesting that this definition given by Rupa Goswami in Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, this verse itself is what is called the Paribhas Sutra of the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu. So in our, in our line, our literatures, our scriptures, they will have a Paribhas Sutra. Paribhas Sutra means literally an emperor verse, okay? So it is considered to be the verse which gives the, the key understanding of that particular literature. And it's said that all other, um, all other verses within the same literature are meant to be seen in light of that key particular verse. And I want to read to you exactly what is explained about this Paribhas Sutra by Srila Jiva Goswami. So just, to, just so we understand the significance of this verse before we dive into the specific statements within the verse itself. So this is a statement by Jiva Goswami in his Krishna Sandarbha commentary. Okay, so he says as follows. This is a direct quote. A Paribhas Sutra explains the proper method for understanding a book. It gives the key by which one may understand the true purport of a series of apparently unrelated facts and arguments. Okay? So even in a, in a literature, once we understand the Paribhas Sutra, we're meant to see everything else or all the other verses in that same literature through the lens of the Paribhas Sutra and in such a way that it feeds into and supports that conclusion. Within our Srimad Bhagavatam, for example, we also have this Paribhas Sutra, Ete Chamsa Kalapum Sa, Krishna Stu Bhagavan Swayam. So literally, whatever else is spoken about within the Srimad Bhagavatam, it is meant to be understood in such a way that it is supportive of that key definitional understanding. And we can take this a step further. And this is why it's so important to, to read and, and discuss this subject matter, because as Rupa Goswami is giving here the definition of pure devotional service, literally everything else that we do in Krishna consciousness should be seen in such a way that it is supportive of this definition of pure devotional service that we're going to be discussing and reading today. Okay, so we explained that this definition, and I'll read it again because I want us to really meditate on this. But we, We'll, we'll look into how this definition has or can be separated into two key areas. What we call the Srup Lakshanam, which is the primary characteristics of pure devotional service, but we'll also explore what is considered to be the Tatashya Lakshanam, the secondary characteristics of pure devotional service as well. So again, the definition. When first class devotional service develops, one must be devoid of all material desires knowledge obtained by monist philosophy and fruitive action. The devotee must constantly serve Krishna favorably as Krishna desires. Okay, so let's just define what we mean by Srup Lakshanam and Tatasha Lakshanam. So when we talk about the primary characteristics in relation to this verse by Rupa Goswami, they define or describe what devotional service actually is. And when we come to the secondary characteristics, their purpose is to distinguish between pure devotional service and mixed devotional service. So one will give a positive definition, or some aspects will give a positive definition, and some statements in this particular verse will explain what, is, what pure devotion is free of. Uh -huh. Now, this is a very interesting principle in life. Why do we have this poverty and this nivrity? Why in our teachings do we have an explanation about the things that we're meant to be doing, but also an explanation about the things that we're meant to avoid? There's a very, very simple reason for this. 
in our life, we all have, we all have a life space. We all have a certain amount of time, a certain amount of energy, a certain amount of association. If we understand only what is to be done, then we leave ourselves open to one of the, one of the, one of the key strategies, one of the key traps of Maya. If I only understand what I'm meant to do and I engage in that activity, but I don't understand what to avoid, then the negative things in my life or the negative things in life can slowly sneak into my life space. As they enter my life space, they can, they can displace the positive goal that I'm striving for and literally fill my life with something negative, which eventually takes over. So what the pure devotees are doing or what they're giving us is helping us to understand, yes, you want to fill your life with this positive thing and you want to make sure that you keep out the Maya. You want to make sure that you keep out of your consciousness those things which will actually damage the very goal that you're trying to achieve with the time and the energy that we have from this moment that we take birth in the material world till the point that we leave the material world. And let's be very honest about this. For all of us, we have limited time in life. It's really important for us as devotees to be able to see how to infuse our spiritual lives in order to, um, in order to get, get to the goal faster. I, I was writing something just from some notes for a, another presentation that we'll give at some other point. And I was, I was writing about what I call the, back, the Bhakti battery. And, and I was having some reflection and I was reflecting based upon what Chandamura Maharaj was saying earlier today, how, you know, many of us are isolated now, we're self-isolating and we may have different, a, a different amount of time on our hands. We may, because of the self-isolation, have even slightly different association but it's a question of what we do with it. It's a question of what we fill our life with. And based upon what we give time and energy to, it gives us a certain energy, a certain charge in our life. When we, when we are in a situation like this, we have an opportunity to recharge our Bhakti battery. By giving more emphasis to the devotional things and giving less emphasis less emphasis to those things that can be unfavorable to our devotion. And when we do this, we're literally, we're literally recharging our devotional battery. Devotional batteries can be recharged in two ways. It's not just one. And it directly relates to what Rupa Goswami is speaking about. We can recharge our devotional batteries by giving more time to the direct practices of Krishna consciousness. Which, which help to saturate our consciousness in Krishna consciousness. So that literally everything else that we do, that, that we need to do, even whether it's our work or our physical maintenance, we can do those things in a devotional way because the consciousness is devotional. But we can also recharge our, our devotional batteries or at least protect that charge of our devotional batteries by toning down those things which are unfavorable to devotional service, ultimately removing those things which can even be unfavorable to pure devotion. So we can get more, more spiritually surcharged in our lives. And I was also, I was also explaining to the, to the devotees in South Africa that this is, this is such a crucial thing to do at this time. We have to understand what spreads the mission. The mission of Krishna consciousness is spread by Krishna. But, but the devotee has a special role in that. The special role that we have is that we're the medium. We can be used as a medium by the Supreme Personality of Godhead to spread the mission. So the medium can spread the mission which is being given by the Master. But how do we do this? The real way that Krishna consciousness is spread is that we have inculcated, we have charged our devotional battery 
strongly. And there's such a strong devotional charge that that spills over in our association, in our preaching, that it literally helps to inspire and energize other people to also take up Krishna consciousness and to move, to run towards the goal of Krishna consciousness. So we're able to give something because we have something. So please look at these, this verse in that particular light. How can I imbibe Krishna consciousness more? How can I surcharge my bhakti battery more strongly so that, that electrical, that devotional charge is literally able to inspire that in other people? Okay, so let's look at these qualities, the Sarup Lakshanam and the Tatasha Lakshanam. So, Sri Prabhupada summarizes, uh, well, actually, no, we'll come back. To, let's look first of all at the three primary characteristics. So, the Sarup Lakshanam has three primary characteristics as listed by Rupa Goswami, as given by Rupa Goswami. And we just want to break this down. So, we'll look at the words, we'll look at the meaning of those words, and we'll, we'll expand on, on those as we go through. So, um, devotional service has three primary characteristics. So this term is used, anushilanam, which means an activity for Krishna's pleasure. Now this is really, it's, it's a really powerful um, point to really understand. So anushilanam has different means, but literally it means cultivation following the predecessor teachers. You know, this is, this is absolutely crucial in how we're going to move forward in devotional life. There's, there's an aversion in Kali Yuga to following authority. Right? And, and that aversion, it has many different dynamics to it. It could be that we were let down by authorities in our youth, let's say our parents. In the, in the modern world, oftentimes people who are, who are positioned as authorities, very often they abuse that position. I, I was reading one of my mentees sent me a quote and it was a quote from Prabhupada and it was interesting because I saw the quote and then I was reading one of the um, books on leadership by Bhakti Tirtamaraj and he made a similar point and Prabhupada was stating how when the head of state is a very spiritual person, a, a devotee of the Lord, you know, so in, in our previous history in the Vedic age we had these Rajrishis, Pariksit Maharaj, um, you know, so many Rajrishis, these great teachers, great leaders, actually. It, Prabhupada stated that when you had such great leadership, very pure devotees in positions of authority, just by their devotional position and prowess, by their devotion to Krishna, automatically a blessing ensued across the entire land, the entire population. But the opposite is also true, unfortunately, and we see this very often in the modern world. When the leaders are very materialistic, atheistic, then it's literally a curse upon that particular nation. Because the, um, the great teachers are literally mediums. What do they do? They are mediums for Krishna's love. They are mediums for Krishna's mercy. They are mediums for Krishna's, Krishna's blessing. And so this Anushilanam, cultivation following predecessor teachers, it really is emphasizing how we're meant to try to please Krishna through understanding what will please him, through hearing from those who are very deeply connected in a bond of love and in a bond of devotion. You know, I was... I was having some amazing reflection recently. As we were studying the scriptures, I was understanding that there's a difference between knowledge and understanding. So the, the tendency, and we'll speak more about this when we talk about the qualifications of devotion, we'll talk about the different levels of devotion. I was understanding that the Kanishta Adhikari has knowledge, but they don't necessarily have understanding. There's a difference. When we, when we hear this shravanam, we, did, we cultivate this knowledge. When we do shravanam and manana, when we reflect on what we've heard, when we inquire on what we've heard, when we inquire especially from the seniors, from, and by senior, 
I mean those who are in advanced in devotion, when we inquire from them, then by that shravana and manana, reflecting on what they've said, reflecting on the entire body of the teachings, then we gain this understanding. We start to understand how all these different pieces of the jigsaw, they all form together towards a conclusion. And this verse is a conclusion. The conclusion of all of our practices is to surrender to Krishna in pure devotional service. Wherever we are on the journey, whatever we're reading about, whatever we're hearing about, whatever we're doing, this is the conclusion. It, it is interesting. Prabhupada spoke about the Bhagavad Gita and he said the last teaching is the most important. Because in the Bhagavad Gita, it talks about many different types of, of yoga, practices, karma yoga, gyan yoga. But Krishna says, those who, you know, uh, you know who, for, for all of those different practices, those who surrender unto me, right? End of, the end of the sixth chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, they are uttama. He says, those who surrender unto me, they are those who actually give up all of these things and come to that conclusion. It's all about service to me. They're uttama. They're, um, some scholars came to visit the manor and they were being shown around by, by um, Shiv Ram Maharaj. And one of them said to Shiv Ram Maharaj, you know, your, your, your Prabhupada, this Bhagavad Gita as it is, um, why don't you change the title? They said that, you know, what's, what seems to be implied by your Srila Prabhupada when he writes Bhagavad Gita as it, as it is, he seems to impl be implying that his Bhagavad Gita is the proper Bhagavad Gita and other people's Bhagavad Gitas are not the bona fide proper Bhagavad Gita. So Shiva Ram Maharaj turned to the, to the, these were scholars and academics. And he explained to me, so they said, Prabhupada isn't implying that. He said, that's exactly what he's saying. So he went on to explain how actually this Bhagavad Gita is giving the conclusion. Huh? As Krishna himself gives, 1866, abandon all varieties of religion and surrender unto me. And then, but it's not just that. He says, surrender unto me. And then he also explains what he will do. I will protect you from all sinful reactions. Do not fear. And that is an essential point. As we cultivate our devotion following the predecessor teachers, Srila Prabhupada, our spiritual masters, the Acharyas, as we do that, we can really understand what we're meant to be doing and we can see how everything else fits as a secondary support to bring us to this one conclusion. There's only one conclusion of our teachings, and that is to serve Krishna in pure devotional service. And when we serve Krishna in pure devotional service, as given by those who are also pure devotees of the Lord, what happens? What happens is we will be able to please Krishna because we will understand what pleases Krishna by those who are already tightly bound in love and affection to Krishna. Okay, now let me just, I'm going to read to you something. This is a, this is a purple from Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita Adi Leela, chapter 2, text number 117. This is Prabhupada speaking about the importance of, of developing this understanding. He says, there are many students who, in spite of reading the Bhagavad Gita, misunderstand Krishna because of imperfect knowledge and conclude him to be an ordinary historical personality. This one must not do. One should be particularly careful to understand the truth about Krishna. If because of laziness one does not know, that one does not come to know Krishna conclusively, one will be misguided about the cult of devotion. Like those who declare themselves advanced devotees and imitate the transcendental symptoms sometimes observed in liberated souls. Although the use of, art, of, of thoughts and arguments is a most suitable process for inducing an uninitiated person to become a devotee, neophyte devo neophytes in devotional service must always alertly understand Krishna through the vision of the revealed scriptures, the bona fide devotees, and the spiritual master. It's exactly what, what Srila Rupa Goswami is saying here. I'll read on. Um, the revealed, sorry, uh, let's see. Unless one hears about Krishna 
from such authorities, one cannot make advancement in devotion to Sri Krishna. The revealed scriptures mention nine means of attaining devotional service, of which the first and foremost is hearing from authority. The seed of devotion can, cannot sprout unless watered by the process of hearing and chanting. One should submissively receive the transcendental messages from spiritually advanced sources and chant the very same messages for one's own benefit as well as the benefit of one's audience. audience. So again, this is Chaitanya Charitamrita Adi Leela, chapter two, text number 117, Prabhupada's own words. I, I will tell you honestly, because we just don't, we don't just, you know, recite, but I, I really want to bring this life for you. I've seen in my own life, I mean, on countless occasions, just how incredible it is to take the guidance of advanced devotees. It, it, it is literally a life changer. That's why this is so important. The trouble in the modern world is that unfortunately, and it's killing modern society, the trouble in the modern world is that there's this relativism. There's this idea that one person's opinion and another person's opinion are equal, but it's not true. It's not, it's not the reality. And the more that someone believes that or fools themselves into believing that, they lose out on, on, a, on an extraordinary gift. You see, the truth of the matter is, perception and understanding is based upon consciousness. There are many things in our teachings which, to be honest, are controversial. Let's be very honest about it. There are many things in our scriptures that are controversial. Many things that have been said by Prabhupada that are controversial. Now, now at that point, you, you can delineate that in different ways. You can go in one direction and say, well, he's saying this, but I don't see it, therefore he must be wrong. Which is what tends to happen in the modern world because, because we're deeply steeped in the modes of passion and ignorance. But if someone has even, even a glimmer of some goodness, even some blessing, then, then one will develop some humility. And what does humility do? Humility allows us to really, and it, it is a painful and uncomfortable reality often, but the painful and uncomfortable reality is that we're like blind men and blind women in the world. And if we just introspect a little bit, we can see that. How many of us have made bad decisions which we are suffering the ramifications of even now? Let's be honest. Many of us. How many of us have, have, have done something and realized later on that it was completely the wrong thing. And we felt, to be honest, foolish. We felt bewildered and we were, we were cheated. Let's be honest. We got cheated. We got scammed by someone. We were lied to. We were, we were tricked. It happens all the time. But, but there's also another point to reflect on. Many of us have seen in our lives, our own progression. We've seen that we see the world differently to how we saw it when we first came into Krishna consciousness. Many of us, if we reflect deeply, we've seen that there's been a progression. And that progression is a progression from bewilderment to a deeper insight, not only into Krishna consciousness in terms of the direct teachings, but it's a deeper insight into ourselves, a deeper insight into the entire existence that we're leading. Where has that come from? It has come from this Anushilana. We've heard something from someone who has a perception that is deeper, more penetrating, and more insightful than our own. So when Rupa Goswami is speaking about this Anushilanam, he's giving us an opportunity to get a transcendental gift. If, if, we're, if we're anyone who's even a little bit humble and wise can understand that the, the progress of any devotee is not a function of our own understanding. It is a function of the submission to the instructions and understanding of a person who has a greater perception than our own. Yeah? In order to be successful in life, one has to have a couple of things. One requires a map of reality that is accurate. This is the first misfortune of the living entities. They don't understand. We don't understand the purpose of life. We don't understand how the material energy is, how the spiritual energy is, how they work. Right? 
and that accurate map of understanding, that, that accurate map of reality, ladies and gentlemen, that extraordinary gift of a map that explains exactly how the material world works, how the material energy works, that explains how the spirit works, that map is called the Srimad Bhagavatam. But it doesn't stop there. It is not enough to have the accurate map of reality. One needs a secondary factor. One needs the ability to accurately apply that map of the reality. This is how the material energy works. This is how the spiritual energy works. One needs the ability to apply that map accurately. And that is applied accurately through the guidance and understanding of those pure devotees who we are, who we are we're surrendered to. So when these two things come together, then life becomes extraordinary. I, I, when I was looking through this, I'm going to ask everyone to go on mute so there's no background noise, please. I can, I can hear some background noise. So please just check that you're on mute just so that we don't have any distractions while we're speaking. Thank you very much. I've seen in my own life, because I, I didn't want to just give a repetition of something, but we wanted to do whatever we can to bring it to life. When people, let's be very honest, when many of us hear about pure devotional service, there's, there's some apprehension. Because we are wondering, if I engage and if I surrender, will I be happy? Will I be fulfilled? Maybe I can hold on to this material thing, hold on to that material thing. But what I really wanted to bring out in this discussion is how we're missing out. By not engaging in pure devotional service, by not, and here we're talking especially about following the predecessor acharyas, we're missing out on the great gift. When we take guidance of those personalities whose consciousness is not within the modes, whose consciousness is not limited to the mode of ignorance, mode of passion, even the mode of goodness, what happens? You're able to see the terrain and you're able to avoid issues and challenges that you didn't even know existed. So yes, we have been hurt by authority. Yes, but that does not mean that authority is, is, is wrong. It means that we should be more discriminating to take proper shelter of the proper authority. And when we do that, then just like a good parent who protects the child from the negative experiences, and helps the child accelerate in positive growth in Krishna consciousness, we can accelerate. I remember, I remember, and I was telling someone about this the other day. So many years, a few years ago, so we were in, I can't remember if it was, um, if it was Slovenia or Croatia, it was one of um, Chandamuli Maharaj's retreats, disciples' retreats. And I remember at the end of the retreat, I came to Maharaj's room, and I was paying obeisances, and I asked Maharaj, Maharaj, is there any instruction for me, just before I left? And then he said something to me, which, to be honest, I mean, it was actually quite extraordinary, because he told me something about myself, and I had no, I wasn't conscious of it. And, I, and I've seen this pattern in my life again and again. If you want to really understand yourself, you need the vision of people who have a greater insight than your own. We're looking for the mercy of pure devotees. We're looking for the perception of pure devotees. We're looking for the guidance of pure devotees. And they, and they, can, they can allow us to step over a, a trap, an issue that we didn't even know existed. So Maharaj told me, he said, Buddha Bhavna, your consciousness is such that you need to do things in a different way. And that's very true. Actually, I'll, I'll read... I was, I was looking at some reading that I had done many years ago. And it said that. It said, you, you have this nature, you, you, you need to innovate. And so Marjan spoke to me about, and Prabhupada spoke about this, old wine in new bottles, right? Finding different ways to present the teachings in new, fresh, and exciting ways which allow people to continue to move forward. And I was thinking about that, it just came to mind a lot, because that's why I framed the class we gave earlier, this idea of the story of you. How do I, how do I express Krishna consciousness in ways which are new, interesting, but, but keep to the essence? So this Anushilanam that is being given here, it, it talks about this literally cultivation following the predecessor Acharyas. And we're gonna encourage you, yes, even if you feel that there's been some bad experiences of, with authority, let's not fall into the conclusion via the mode of passion. 
The mode of passionate conclusion is, I've had bad experiences with authority, so I don't follow authority. The higher conclusion is, I've had some bad experiences of authority, so now, now let me seek out the proper authority. Let me surrender to proper authority and let me be blessed to follow proper authority in order to attain the goal of pure Krishna consciousness, in order to, to, to attain the goal of love of Krishna. It's very powerful. When we, when we, when we, when we are in the association of advanced devotees and in the proper mood in that association, what happens? We open our hearts to their guidance, to their inspiration. People wonder, why is it Prabhupada was able to to bring so many people together from all different backgrounds. Why? It's because Prabhupada, Prabhupada was a living example of the devotion of Krishna. We were able to understand that Krishna loves us. We were able to understand that Krishna supports us. We were able to understand that Krishna protects us because we saw the example of Krishna's devotee who was carrying that potency. So when Prabhupada was on the planet, it was as if an incarnation of the Supreme Personality of Godhead was walking on the planet at the time. That's extraordinary. Think about that. When the pure devotee is on the planet, it, so Prabhupada, he's predicted in so many literatures, Sajana Tushanti, Bhakti Notako, other places, Chaitanya Mangal. It's as if the, the Lord himself, because this is a Shakti Yavesh avatar, it's as if Krishna was walking on the planet and that potency was present. I remember hearing from one Prabhupada disciple. He said that when Prabhupada was on the planet, wherever you were on the planet, you could feel that devotional energy was present on the entire planet, wherever you were. And I think about what that means. That devotional energy was present on the planet and could be felt by those who were in connection with Prabhupada. So Krishna appeared 5,000 years ago. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu appeared 500 years ago. Srila Prabhupada appeared within the last 50, 60 years. Shakti Yavai Let's go into this even further. So Anushilam, that, that, see this word Anu means literally that which follows. Okay, so this emphasis is on the Guru Parampara and that one must have a Guru in order to understand how to please the Lord. Uh -huh. The, the, other, the other point to bring out here in this Anushilanam is this idea of cultivation, which indicates activity. So it's very interesting. The devotee is the messenger. In the Nam Sankirtan mission, we're meant to deliver Krishna's message, Prabhupada's books, the message that, the, that people are loved, cared for by the Lord, and he's looking for them to return. The devotee is the messenger. The devotee is also taking guidance from the medium. The spiritual master, Prabhupada says, is a transparent via medium. Huh? But that medium is something very powerful because the devotee, by following the medium, the guru, the devotee is also becoming a medium themselves. Sometimes we have arguments in our movement because people have an issue with different statements. First of all, they may take the statement out of context of the direct space in, in the scripture. I was thinking very much about what... Um, because I, I was approached by some devotees and they had an issue of this comment by Prabhupada about women, right? And I, and I was explained to them and explained it beautifully and Prabhupada says it directly in Bhagavatam that woman means the opposite sex, right? So that point, it wasn't, un so unless we approach people who have a deeper understanding, one could have read that and taken the complete wrong understanding from it, you see? So we have this idea that the statements can be taken out of context in terms of the direct place in the Bhagavatam in which the statement is made. It can be taken out of context because it's not understood within the general statements about that particular topic. But there's a third, there's a third way that our teachings can be taken out of context. The third way that our teachings can be taken out of context is out of the cultural context. You see, if something is said philosophically by a person who loves you and cares for you, it changes the meaning. You see, it changes the meaning. It, 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 the meaning no longer becomes, oh, this person is saying this about this or that. It, it actually becomes this loving person 
is saying this, that means that the statement is ultimately being given by a loving purpose, by a loving person, and is being given most importantly for a loving purpose. And that makes it easier for people to accept the message. So, so sometimes people wonder, how was Prabhupada able to bring everyone together? It's because he carried the culture as well as the teachings. This culture of our teachings, what, what is the culture? The culture is bhakti, pure, loving, devotional service. So if everything, just like we say this Parapa Sutra is the emperor verse explaining how everything should be seen in that light, the example, the pure devotee, they show the example of how everything is meant to culminate. Everything in our teachings is meant to culminate in loving devotion to Krishna. And because one loves Krishna, one has natural affection and compassion for all of Krishna's parts and parts. So I often think that we may, we may have missed this point as, as devotees. We sometimes talk about the activity, but we don't also bear in mind the mood. And Jiva Goswami speaks about that, actually. He, he talks about the cultivation of devotion. He says it has two aspects. He talks about the chaster, which is the activity, and he also speaks about how it also has an underlying mood, which is called the bhava. And both of them are connected. So the activity is meant to include the mood. You know? How are we going to... Prabhupada said this movement will spread like, as, as a cultural um, conquering of the world. What does that mean? I can tell people about Krishna. I can tell people about devotion. But if I follow properly in the line of the previous acharyas, I will show them by the love, care, and concern that I extend towards them. And by the love, care, and concern I extend towards them, it will touch their hearts and they will understand through the devotees, through the medium, they will, it will bring the message to life. So please think about that when you go out for your preaching. Think about that when you interact with the devotees, interact with the outside world. How, how will these people know that? How are they going to know that there's a God who, who loves them? How are they going to know that there's someone who sees their suffering and wants their suffering to end? How will they know that there's a spiritual world with countless living entities who, who, who want them to come back as we engage in loving devotional service? They're going to know through the loving example. So we as devotees are meant to bring the, world, the words of the scripture to life by being the example. And Prabhupada did that. He, Prabhupada's example was so, so powerful, so kind, so touching, so inspiring that people wanted to surrender just to please him. And if, we're, if we mean this Anushilanam, if we mean this idea of following the footsteps, it means that our words, so our body, our mind, our words are meant to follow in that example. And it's not just an example when we're preaching or, or trying to speak to people who are new. It has to be in the association of devotees. How will I understand that Krishna loves me? I will understand that Krishna loves me through following the instructions. And also, th there's another side to this. You see, we often, we often abdicate our responsibility. We, we, will, we will want Krishna to surrender to Krishna. To, we will want people to surrender to Krishna. But we have a role to play in that. You see? What will inspire someone to surrender? If I provide proper shelter, they will be inspired to take shelter, which means to surrender. Right? So when I go out into the world, am I providing proper shelter by being, by imbibing this teaching, by following through the instructions of my own, you know, my own spiritual teachers? Am I being a proper shelter? If, if people don't surrender, the first thing we need to do is look, what, what about me? Am I being a proper example? Because unless they see the example of devotion through the good behavior of the devotees, it will be hard for them to believe that there's a God who cares about them. So this primary characteristic, activity for Krishna's pleasure. And just one other thing on this, it has to be like that. If there's real devotion, it will be expressed through its symptoms. Narada Muni says, Yashaya lakshanam proktam. Things can be understood through their lakshana 
through their symptoms. So if there is devotion, there'll be activity. And what will that activity be? It will be service. It will be devotional service. Okay, let's look at this other point. So Prabhupada says that there are two aspects to Anushilanam. He talks about the activities favorable to Krishna consciousness and the avoidance of activities unfavorable. And we touched upon that because we don't want Maya to sneak into our life. We don't want those things. We, we, we may know what we want, but that's not enough. We also want to know what do I need to avoid? And in that way, we make it very strong. But there's more to it. The second point, the second aspect of, of the second primary aspect of pure devotional service is this anukul yena, which is devotional service is executed with a favorable intention. Yeah. Now let's look at that. Favorable intention means that one serves in order to please Krishna. It's not incidentally pleasing. It should be done with the objective of pleasing Krishna. Why? So Prabhupada would often quote this point. He says, Bhava Grahi Janadana. Krishna accepts the essence of a devotee's service. Now, the question come, okay, how do, how do I nourish that? It's, it's so interesting. We talk about Maya being the illusory energy. And one of the illusory potencies is that potency of forgetfulness. We all have that reciprocation from Krishna. It's so amazing. We, we can remember this. You've been in a kirtan and you just felt so transformed and uplifted and blissful and, and, and it, it touched your heart and the mood. You, you had this very strong mood and it's like, that was incredible. See, when we explain sometimes to people that there is such a thing as kirtan, you can chant the holy names of the Lord because for them it's just an idea because they've never been in that experience. But once a person is touched by the experience, it's no longer philosophy, it's no longer theory, it is experience. It is something that I've been in, I understand. If we reflect on these things, if I reflect on how many times Krishna has reached out to me, how many times Krishna has touched me, how many times Krishna has protected me, how many times Krishna has guided me, then this becomes natural this favorable intention to please Krishna, because what, what am I doing? When, when, when someone is constantly given to you with love, with care, in good times and in bad times, then any decent person becomes touched and wants to reciprocate. So all we need to do to remember this point about this anukulya, aluk, anukulyena, devotional service executed with a favorable intent, we have to remember that we've been given. We, you see, when Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu came, we, we say it's 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 a dis, uh, he descended. But but in, it, but in another real sense, he didn't descend. He didn't descend. Krishna is a supreme personality of Godhead. But what did Krishna do in the form of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu? He came as his own devotee, Prabhupada. I remember reading this. I remember reading Krishna book and Prabhupada states in Krishna book, he says, the devotees of the Lord enjoy hundreds of thousands of millions of times more than the Lord himself. What does that mean? So when Krishna came as Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he was showing us that you don't need to be envious of my position of God. You don't need to be envious of my position because in the, in, the, in the position of the devotee, that position is superior. When Krishna came as Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he was showing that you don't need to envy my position of, uh, as Bhagavan, as the Supreme Lord, because I have given you, as a devotee, I've given you a position that is eternally superior to my own. So we can say that, that Krishna descended as Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, but we can also consider in a very real sense, it was an ascension. Krishna ascended from being the Supreme Personality of Godhead to take the position of his own devotee to relish, to relish more than the Lord himself relishes. And so we, we, can, we can nourish this mood 
we can nourish this mood of anukuyena by remembering it's not, it's not a forced reciprocation. Every day of our lives, we've been given something. And if we can't, if we can't even reciprocate with what we've been given, then how hard our hearts can be. If you can't even reciprocate with someone who's been giving to you unconditionally since time immemorial, with the hope that one day, that one day we will just turn to him, then where is our gratitude? So this is this is this other characteristic, the second primary characteristic. Devotional service is executed with a favorable intention, remembering that my my supreme Lord, He wants me to come back to the spiritual world more more than I do. Remembering my supreme Lord. He's given me a position as a devotee, which, which is relished even more than the, than the position of God himself. Why can, I not, why can I not reciprocate with that? That he's reached out to me again and again, constantly throughout my life, to, to be sharing me wisdom, insight, affection, support through the association of devotees. He's been there to give me fearlessness, to give me confidence, why is it that I can't reciprocate with that? So when we reflect on these experiences which have happened in our lives many times, we can tune into this anukul We and it's, it's reciprocation. And you know what's so wonderful about the reciprocation? Yeya tamam prapadyante. As we, as, as we reciprocate, we're able to experience more of it. Bhakti breeds bhakti. The miracles, the fulfillment, the ecstasy, the insight, all of these things are unlimited. The unlimited ocean, the nectar, the, ocean, the, the unlimited ocean, the nectarian ocean of devotional service is unlimited. There's never any satiation. There's no limit. Well, is it, well, is it the, the stated in Sri Bhagavatam? Ahoituki apratiyata. We don't, we don't agree with the other mundane religions in, in mood. We disagree in mood because in many cases, the mood can come across as punishing. God is an authority. You will do what he says or else. We don't agree with that mood. Our mood is a mood of, of deep, personal, loving and affectionate relationship. We want to be we want to reciprocate with the touching and selfless mood of Krishna. And this uninterrupted, unmotivated, uninterrupted devotional service. And what does the Bhagavatam say? When we do that, it does what? It completely satisfies the self. So we want to take to this devotion. We want to practice these qualities, knowing that everything will be taken care of. The supreme sweetness of the Lord is, is an impetus for us. It is an impetus for us. And the more that we understand how much we've been given constantly, constantly, the natural thing is that we will want to give back. Let's go to this third characteristic, that Krishna is the sole beneficiary of our devotional service. So it's, the idea is here is that the de pure devotional service is not for anyone else. It's not for a demigod. It's not for a mundane personality. It is Krishna, who is a sole beneficiary, beneficiary. And Prabhupada makes a statement in Nectar of Devotion. He says, when we speak of Krishna, we refer to the Supreme Personality of Godhead along with his expansions. Now, it's interesting. There's also a statement by Prabhupada. He says that Krishna and his devotees and paraphernalia, they are integral to his service. So, service with the intent to please Krishna or to please his pure devotees also constitutes pure devotion. That's stated in the introduction to the nature of devotion. So it's a collective. We're very fortunate. We are, we, we, we are part of a devotional community. When Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu descended, the message he was sending by his example was not, how will I go back to Godhead? That, that is not the mood of this, of this Sankirtan movement. The mood of the Sankirtan movement 
is how will we go back to Godhead? With our support and our care for one another, how can I become more of a medium of Krishna's love and kindness by following this pure devotional service? How can I, by following it, become more full of Krishna's kindness and mercy in order to distribute it in a meaningful way? in order to show by my example that there is a supreme person who cares about everyone so that that, de that devotion that's coming from Krishna is literally spilling over through my examples and touches other people so that they understand there must be a God. There must be a God. Just look at how this person is and therefore become inspired to move in that same direction. We, we need to think about that. Let's move on. We said, so we talked about the three primary characteristics given by Rupa Goswami in this um, Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, this Paribhar Sutra. Now we will talk about the um, two secondary characteristics. So the first three are what pure devotional service is. The second two are what pure devotional service is not. Well, it has to be free of. The first one, Anya Bilasita. So this means that devotional service must be free of material desires okay now this you see this word anya bilasit ta that last part of the word ta it means literally ness it means to be free of desire ness to be free of being um of materialistic tendency or, or desire so now it's interesting the Desire to preserve one's life is a natural desire, and that's not con that, doesn't, that doesn't constitute a material desire in that sense. But what we're really looking at here is this, um, this material tainting. Why, why are we concerned that the pure devotional service should be free of material desires? Why? It's because it interrupts the flow of affection. When pure devotional service is mitigated by material desires, it means that our love has some other repository. It's going somewhere else. It's not going purely to Krishna. And it's also based upon ignorance. Let, let's think about this. It's based upon ignorance. Everything that you desire, everything, the person that you find attractive, that potency of attractiveness, that's Krishna. It's just manifested in some small portion through that particular person. The... the the shelter that you're looking for, right? So you want to feel protected. But that sense of protection, it's not coming from, you know, you having a job. What's, look, look at what's happening now. Every, all the economists are predicting, are predicting that, the West, that the entire world is going to go into a global recession. So someone says, I feel secure because of my job, but so many people are going to lose their job now. So it wasn't the job that's given protection. If, to the extent that anything is giving protection, it's just reflecting a potency of Krishna in some small and temporary way. So ultimately, everything that we're looking for is present in its unlimited form where? Everything that we're looking for, when you trace it back, everyone is looking for Krishna. When you trace it back, Every single one of us are looking for Krishna. And when you, when you look at anything in the world that you find attractive, we're only attracted by Krishna. Those opulences are a shadow expression, a temporary expression. And if, those are, if the temporary expression draws our attention, can you, can you imagine what it would be like if we're in the presence of the Supreme Lord himself? Can you imagine? It's good to take some time out to think, what would it be like to be back in the spiritual world? I'm going to encourage you to take some time out. What would it be like to be able to chant the holy names and to cry for Krishna? To remember how much this person saved me, how kind this person is. I was giving a presentation to a group of devotees recently, and we were talking about the need to develop the right mental culture. Many of us, we spend so much of our, our mental energy thinking about the things that we don't want. Right? Worry is a prayer for something that we do not want. And so we work against ourselves. We think about, 
okay, well, if I lose my job, we think about, well, if I have an argument with this person, but how many times do we consciously try to use our mental energy, body, mind, and words to think about what I do want? I want to be back with Krishna. Let me meditate on that. I want to chant my rounds better. Let me meditate on that. I want to study the teachings more. Let me meditate on that. I want to become a better devotee. Let me meditate on that. I want to cry out to Krishna from the heart. I want every atom of my being to desire Krishna. Let me meditate on that. And every time we do this, we're deepening the right desires. And when our, our, our correct desires become stronger, they uproot our weaker desires and help us to move forward. So this Anya Bilasata, this is part of the, we call it Tatasha Lakshanam, the secondary characteristics. So these are the things that pure devotion is free of. And then I'll go to the last one, then we'll open up for questions. The last one, Jnana Karma Dhanavritam. So this understanding is that the pure devotion is not covered by philosophical or fruitive pursuits. Okay, so there's a few things here. So as we read, and this, again, I'll give you the ref reference. So Prabhupada gives a for a translation to this Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu 1111 in the Chaitanya Charitamrita Madhya Lila chapter 19 text number 167 and where he talks about this garment where he writes about this Jnana Karma Dhanavritam he says let's see here yes so so Jnana by the knowledge of the philosophy of the monist Mayavadis Karma by fruitive activities Adi by artificially practicing detachment, by the mechanical practice of yoga, by studying the Sankhya philosophy and so on. Sometimes people think, sometimes devotees may think, oh, you know, Prabhupada's books is Gyan. No, this is it's different. This is, pure, this is pure devotional knowledge. That's meant to be cultivated. That should be cultivated. This Gyan is this other types of Gyan, okay? So Anavritam, not covered, you see? And that's what we're talking about. We, our devotion should be covered by philosophical or fruitive pursuits. So Prabhupada elaborates on this. He said that the Gyan is defined as philosophical speculation that leads one to voidism or impersonalism. And this is a direct quote from Prabhupada. This is from the Nectar of Devotion in the earlier part of the book. Quote, the ultimate end of philosophical speculation then must be Krishna. With the understanding that Krishna is everything, the cause of all causes, and that one should therefore surrender to him. That's a direct quote from the Nectar of Devotion. So we know that karma is a fruitive activity. It includes karma kanda, ritualistic activities, even if they're described in the Vedas. Pure devotional service is free of, those, of that kind of covering. And interestingly enough, this word RD, it literally means all other pursuits, right? So the same paradigm applies to all other pursuits. One must not allow one's devotional service to be covered by other pursuits, such as renunciation. Renunciation may be a part of our practice, but it shouldn't be the, the goal of our practice. It's only taken up to the extent that it's supportive of our movement towards pure devotional service, yoga, etc. So other pursuits must be undertaken, but they must remain secondary. So he says, Prabhupada also says that many forms of so-called renunciation are also not favorable to Krishna consciousness, uh, to Krishna conscious devotional service. Those things we leave aside. So in summary, Rupa Goswami is giving us a very powerful understanding of what pure devotional service is in order to move towards a goal. He's giving us an understanding of what pure, devotee, pure devotional service is not. So we can clear those anatas, those unwanted things from our life space but we can also take this description as an incitement for inspiration. We can look at this and reflect upon this to desire this. It's not an imposition, it's not, it's not that one is giving up enjoyment, it is that one is looking to come to surrender in a deep way to one's true shelter. We're already extraordinarily fortunate because we've understa understood the goal for which every single living entity, not just in this material world, but in every single material universe has taken place. 
The teachings have given us the goal, but now we want to accelerate towards the goal through understanding the goal more deeply. And I'll end on this last point. Prabhupada explains in more than one place, and it's one of the places is the Krishna book. He says, when we understand what we're doing, devotional service done in knowledge, it actually draws us more benefit. We, we're able to get more benefit to purify, purify ourselves more and to make greater progress because we understand what we're actually involved in. This Krishna consciousness is a science. As Krishna himself says in the Bhagavad Gita, at the Atma Vidya, Vidyanam. Of sciences, I am the supreme science of self-realization. So let us try to unwrap the gift. Let us try to unwrap the gift. Prabhupada was explaining in one place, and I was just reading this before, that when we do activity following Krishna's desire, right? So when we do activity, meaning that we do it under the guidance of Guru Sadhu Shastra, then the Sarup Shakti, the internal potency of Krishna, coming through the Guru, literally spiritualizes the activities that we're doing. You know? That's actually a point that's made by Prabhupada in the Nature of Devotion, right? Quote, he said, well, he talks about how the energy by which devotional service is done, quote, can be spiritualized by the mercy of both the bona fide spiritual master and Krishna. We've been given something very, very powerful in this life. It is, it is a, a gift of, you know, immense and, and, and incalculable value. Even, even the, the crisis that the world is facing, just a, a drop of devotional service would inundate, inundate the world with so much piety, it would change everything. So our gift is explosive, it is concentrated grace. Concentrated grace. And what we're trying to do in Krishna consciousness is to take full advantage. And this definition of pure devotional service is to accelerate us in understanding what we're doing so we can do it better, get more, more mercy from the process and become the medium. We're gonna spread this mission by being such a living example of Krishna's mercy by, by filling ourselves up with the mercy, the people, they won't have to speculate about whether God exists or not. They will understand that Krishna, that there is a supreme person, not even just a supreme person, not just, sorry, they will understand more than that there's a God. They will understand the affectionate, sweet nature of the Lord. They will understand the affectionate, sweet nature of the Lord. They'll understand the affection that Krishna has. And they will be conquered by that affection because they will see it in our examples. So now is the time. Now is the time for each and every one of us to go beyond just the message. We, we continue to give the message, yes. But Rupa Goswami in this definition is saying that we must become the medium. We must become the message as a living example. I, I was reading this point. Um, so I was reading this really wonderful point about the Supreme Lord, about Krishna, and how the Srup Shakti, Krishna's internal potency, has two aspects. One is this Aishvarya, which is supreme opulence. The other is the um, Madhurya, which is the supreme sweetness. And when the, opulent, when, the, when the opulence dominates the sweetness, then you have the form of Narayan. When the sweetness dominates the opulence, then you have Krishna. Right? Krishna, Raj Krishna, Krishna in Vrindavan. And that Krishna in Vrindavan is even more attractive than all the other Vaikuntha Murtis, all the other forms in, in all the other areas in the, in the spiritual world. So let's give the gift properly by becoming the medium and delivering the message. Okay, I'll stop there and say thank you very much for listening of your time. Let's, let's open up for any comments or questions. And first of all, sorry, forgive me. We should ask that if Maraj or any of the other seniors would like to make any commentary first before we go to questions and answers. Maraj, would you like to say any words, any corrections? Hey, Krishna. Hey, Krishna. 
you gave us so much in, in a very concise but very direct way that I'm just uh, trying to process it. And uh, there were many, many powerful points. I think the point that I really, really resonated was that in our own life, being an example for Krishna's love, Krishna's mercy, um, for uh, to others, and when, and how to bring that consciousness about and bring that activity in a day in our day to day life and reach others, because uh, everything about Krishna is wonderful, but our ability to bring Krishna to others will be seen. People will see Krishna through us. So it's important that we be the example for what Krishna wants us to be in terms of what he wants to give to others. So I found that point that you made is, was really, really, you know, the essence of uh, our own practice of Krishna consciousness. Because when we do that, we're also edifying our own spiritual life at the same time. Thank you so much, Marge. And thank you for inspiring us with such a wonderful commentary. Because you've also inspired me at this point. If we, if we had that mood of trying to really imbibe it, to, to be an example, we'll be much more effective in giving it to other people. Let's be honest, people have been hurt so much in the material world that they, they, yeah, they, they, they question if, they, if, if it's possible for there to be a supreme being who actually has their best interests at heart, who isn't going to make them a slave, who's not just going to punish them, but, but we can make a difference, but we have to do it by being that example ourselves. And if we do, everything can, and to be honest, apart from that, it's a supreme motivation. Who, who, who's motivated by just having to struggle? But isn't it much more, more exciting to be motivated? Let me chant my rounds properly. Let me engage purely so that I can really serve Krishna properly. I can really love him and experience his love for me and distribute that purity to other people. I don't know about you guys, but I find that just incredibly exciting. I mean, just your life becomes saturated with, with devotion because you become an open channel. And, and as Prabhupada talks about being an instrument, right? You become a channel and an instrument of infinite grace, infinite grace. And no matter what happens to you, you feel surcharged and saturated. You can handle any situation, whether it's the coronavirus or anything else. It doesn't disturb you because the very thing that everyone is struggling for, you're saturated with it. You can actually feel Krishna's love. For me, I just find that so, so inspiring, so motivating, and so exciting. Yeah, thank you. It's complete. You're covering yourself, and you're covering what Krishna wants for everyone else, simply by focusing on how to do everything with quality and the right mood. And you mentioned the importance of the mood. And the mood underlines the the effectiveness of everything you do. If the if the activity is right but the mood is wrong, then you don't. It doesn't go deep. It just stays on the outside, and other people will will not be inspired at the same time. So I was just thinking, kind of like to sum it up, the 26 qualities of a devotee are really the foundation by which we live our life. In order to bring about that mood, those 26 qualities are kind of like, this is the character of a devotee. Yeah. Now, of course, I won't mention them because they're so long, but they're, they're there in the Bhagavatam. At least three or four different places, Prabhupada lists them. So thank you. I give give other devotees a chance to respond to your wonderful, inspire, inspirational class. Thank you. Thank you, much. I know that we have senior devotees. I know Mother Vishaka is on the line, and Sundar Ananda, and others. So if any of you, Mother Vishaka, if you'd like to make any commentary, Sundar Ananda or others, please feel free to do so. I also wanted to thank you for a very inspiring and thought-provoking class. The point I really appreciated among many, many points, was how you were advised at some point to put the old wine in a new bottle. I think that's so important. Each generation is different from the last. And I think if you can inspire your peers, and you're also inspiring us, 
who are old, old folks now, <laughs> then that's a, a wonderful and much needed service. So I thank you very, very much for that. Thank you very much, Mother Vishak, and thank you for, for helping us all in our entire Yatra by your leadership and your example. We're very grateful. Hare Krishna Babu. Um, as usual, a wonderful and inspiring class. Um, can you hear me? I can hear you very clearly, Prabhu. Please continue. So, I just wanted to make two points. Um, when, I was, when I first read this verse, I was struck with the Anya Bilashita. And you made this point about Ta being the Ness. And uh, Upa Goswami could have just said Anya Bilash, Anya Bilasha Shunyam, and that was the end of the story. And then often the question is asked: Did when Draupadi called for help, was she not in pure devotional service? Because her uh, desire was to save her life. And so, so beautifully explained that um, that Tha has been added for an exceptional situation to save your life. But what we do is we do go ta 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 ta. We keep adding more tas to it, and then we keep asking Krishna to do to you know be the order supplier. And I think that's that's a real um, wonderful aim to 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 aim for is to have this pure devotional service. Uh, this is such a wonderful uh, verse. And the other thing which I really, from a personal perspective, which really inspires what you just mentioned about, you know, when we talk about being the ambassadors of Krishna consciousness. And, and we being, you know, trying to do, to, to do the service. Often we are asked, oh, we can't, what have we got to offer? And I really think about this concept of the Yukta Vairagya, that whatever skill we have, uh, we should be able to offer that in Krishna's service. So if somebody is, a, is an engineer or somebody is, a, is an electrician, at this time of day, if the temple lights go off and, and you know, if there's nobody else to come in, they can come and fix it. Uh, somebody like me, who's a poor doctor, can can offer services for for medical reasons at this time. So I think it's just so important that we just keep doing best what we can do from our skills, but use that in Krishna service. It just makes it such a wonderful all-rounded. Uh, and then because you're not doing it for yourself, you're doing it for Krishna or his devotees. It is such more, it gives so much more pleasure than just doing it for yourself. So that's really uh, the two take-home points for me. Thank you, Prabhu. Thank you very much. Very good. So, um, how do we do this in terms of questions? I think the organizers will ask, they'll, you will choose the questions and then we'll try and answer. And I will, I will ask Maraj, Vishaka Mataji, and all of those who are my seniors, please you know, feel free to answer the questions because you always have more insight and realization. But then um, we'll just try and hear any of the questions and comments and then just go from there. So, um, Hare Krishna, how, Prabhu. Hare Krishna. Krishna. Thank you for such a profound and intimate session. We have numerous questions that have come in. So well, I, don't think, I don't think we're going to give you a break at all. <laughs> so shall we start with the first question? Okay, what's the question? Okay, the first question is, in the Anya Bilashita Sunyam verse, how do we understand that we should serve Krishna favorably and the way he desires? How can we know what he desires? Does it refer to which service we do or the mood of service or both? Okay. So Thank you. let's go back. So we touched upon this before. See, we want to understand Krishna from someone who loves him, actually. You know, so we touched upon this idea that we're often a little bit, uh, let's say, jaded through the material experiences in the material world. But we want to try and go to our advanced authorities, the spiritual master. We want to take it from those sources. So guru, sadhu, shastra. Honestly speaking, I, I can tell you from my own experience, if you do that, you will get insight that you could not get otherwise. I, I, it's happened to me in my life again and again and again it's, it's actually quite incredible and i'll be honest i i find that inc that's one of the things that inspired me the most because it's almost see there's there's a there's a thing there's a concept called mission impossible right so sometimes they'll, it's like this like film series and so what happens in the mission is that that what happens in that series is you have this secret agent and he's given his mission right he's given something to do and and we need to trust, but we, we should use also discrimination. We should choose wisely our, our, you know, our authorities and so on, but we should have authorities. And it should be chosen according to scriptures. 
but we should choose wisely and then, and then inquire, try to understand, try to serve. And if you do that properly in good association, you'll never lose out. So we understand what Krishna wants through those who have a deeper connection to the Supreme Lord. That's actually how we understand it. And we, we hear from them in the proper mood. So it's not blind. It's not blind faith. See, nowadays people talk about any kind of faith being blind faith, but there are two things. There's blind faith and there's blind doubt. So we're not meant to blindly accept, like Krishna's, like um, Prabhupada explains in, in the purpose of Bhagavad Gita, we try to get a proper understanding, right? So it's not blind faith, but we don't also want to go to the other extreme where it's just blind doubt, where I just don't want to hear from anyone and I think that I, everything will be fine. If you want to get intimately connected to Krishna, we are introduced literally, especially intimately, not just by the scriptures, that's there and that's important, but also by those who have a very deep connection with the Lord. So all of those coming together, they make for an extraordinary spiritual life because not only do we understand more about what Krishna wants, but we can also feel more of his love and affection through the example of his pure devotees. So if we don't do that, we are, and I do emphasize this, we are missing out. We're missing out on that superior insight. I was approached by one person recently and they had some challenges about some of the things in Shastra, but I was able to explain to them, look, I understand that some of the things you don't understand yet, but we have to understand that when someone's in Shuddha Sattva, their perception is different to someone who's in a lower mode. It, you, it's not the same. Even some of you on the call, as you come to, more to goodness, you start to see, you see things differently. The things that you didn't understand on day one in Krishna consciousness, now you look and you think, that's completely correct. I didn't see it before, but now I can see it. So there is this progression in consciousness. As we purify ourselves, perception is based upon consciousness. It, it really is. I, I can tell you, it's a fact. You know, so that's how we'll do it. That's how we'll understand what Krishna wants through those who have a, a, a tight pact, a tight connection with Krishna. And they will introduce us into that spiritual community as we progress as well. Thank you for your question. Uh, did that did that answer your question or do I do I need to clarify further? That question was from Radha Vinodini, so maybe she can let us know on chat whether that answered her question. Thank you. Thank you. We can move on to the next question. Yeah, unless unless any of the seniors would like to add anything or their own insights to that question, then we'll then we'll move on. So for okay. each question, I'll I'll say something, but if any of my seniors would like to comment. Adjust, feel, please feel free. Okay, if no one's saying anything, then please go on to the next question. Okay, so the next question is related um, somewhat to the previous question. You talked about Bhakti battery. And a question is, how do we prioritize our activities favorable to Krishna consciousness? But how do you prioritize within the favorable activities for example, when is it okay to say no to a service as a result of burnout? Is burnout a result of your own immaturity or is it just lack of understanding the service? That's a very good question. It can be both. It can be due to a lack of understanding so that therefore we didn't strike the right balance. It could be also due to being overzealous we're trying to do devotional. So we want to come to the transcendental platform. At the same time, if you read carefully, especially chapter 14 and chapter 18 of the Bhagavad Gita as it is, Prabhupada explains that we have to come to the platform of doing devotional service in the mode of goodness. And from the mode of goodness, we come to the platform of pure transcendental devotional service. So one of the characteristics of devotional service in the mode of goodness is it's done in knowledge, it's done wisely. And it's, it's sustainable. Goodness is sustainable. So if I've done something in such a way that I've burnt out, it means that I was not doing my devotional service in the way was, that was sufficiently wise and sustainable. So what we, what we need to try and do is, as Krishna says, you know, the, the balance between work and recreation. So we're, we're serving and we're also giving ourselves sufficient time to rest, recharge. Why? 
I'm giving myself sufficient time to rest and recharge so that I can continue to enthusiastically serve. And if I'm not sure about the balance, I should use my intelligence to weigh it up. And I should also, through good association, get that balance correct in order to make sure that year upon year, I can continue. And, and I'm going to add one thing to this because unfortunately, there are a lot of people in our movement who are resentful because they got burnt out. And in many cases, maybe not all, but in many cases, it's because we did not engage in devotional service wisely. We have to do this, we have to follow this process as a science. You know, Prabhupada states that. Someone sent me a quote, I think it's from Fifth Canto, but Prabhupada is talking about the scientific execution of devotional service. We, we have to do this, we have to mature as devotees to execute our devotional service wisely so that year in year out we can continue to be enthusiastic active inspired in our devotional service and 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 it's no one else's responsibility but our own to maintain that okay it's really important we don't want to become victims we don't want to see ourselves as a victim so let us learn the learn the teachings properly let us hear it properly when we're not sure let us take guidance properly and in that way, we will navigate this journey all the way from where we are, all the way back home, back to Krishna's lotus feet in the spiritual world. Now, I'll just pass over to Maharaj, uh, Mother Vishaka, Sundarananda, or any others to give any, any commentary on that question. Yeah, one thought came to my mind. Am I on? Yes, Maharaj. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's, it's also something that I've been focusing on as a foundation to build my own devotional service. I see that out of all the activities of devotional service, and the, the whole process is like you could come use as the analogy if you like you're building a house. And uh, the strength of the foundation will be the, uh, the uh, credit to the house if the, this foundation is weak what you try to build on that will also be very much easily affected or uh, uh, not giving us the inspiration that we are looking for through those activities of devotional service. So coming back to the foundation, I think the, the emphasis is on hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord, and specifically in our day-to-day -day life, uh, putting our chanting of our rounds as the most important part of our day and the, the thing that we can build our Krishna consciousness on. So personally, I've been chanting 16 rounds before I do anything else. I've been doing it for a few years now. And despite all my other, what we say, uh, what's the word? Uh, mistakes that I might make in devotional service, somehow I can somehow other keep going and, over, and try to overcome these things because I keep the holy name first. So that's, it might sound like an oversimplification, but I think it's pretty much the essence of our practice is hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord. That, that goes right to the heart and inspires us. And it also attracts us to Krishna more and more. And if there's a weakness in that area in terms of the quality, just like you mentioned, just working on something and trying to perfect it and develop it and, and get not only the uh, knowledge that comes from it, but the understanding and how to, you know, uh, what it means to us and how we can progress in devotional service by this activity uh, becomes the inspiration to keep going. So I, you know, uh, you know, I'm quite simple. I just like to chant Hare Krishna. <laughs> so <laughs> I feel if there's any, if I have any, any hope in Krishna consciousness, it's all centers around the holy name. <laughs> so I don't have a lot of knowledge or a lot of expertise in doing things, but I find that I just keep going in Krishna consciousness and feel inspired by by the holy name. So I hope that doesn't, <laughs> you know, uh, what we say, uh, uh, underestimate every, anything else that's important, but it's really the foundation for everything else we want to do in Krishna consciousness. That's my realization anyway. 
Mother Vishaka, Sundarananda, do any of you want to comment? If not, we'll go to the next question. Yeah, sorry, Hare Krishna. Um, um, it was muted. Um, it was a wonderful question about, about, I think, getting exhausted in the service. I think that was the gist of the question. I just wanted to say a couple of things. One was about, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. One was about the, uh, why do we get exhausted in doing any service? We get exhausted in doing any service. Of course, there's a physical component to it, but there's more important is that there's a mental component to it. And if we, if our heart is not in that service, we will feel exhausted very quickly. So I guess it also depends on our consciousness of performing that service. If we take our service to be a, a burden or a load, um, uh, or a chore, then we are going to get exhausted soon. So I think if we if we have the right consciousness of serving, uh, and why we are serving is just to please Krishna or his devotees, I think that that exhaustion comes less. And then there's a practical aspect of it. Uh, do, I always say that devotees wear their heart in their sleeves, because they just keep going and keep going and keep going till they get completely burnt out. And I think uh, Prabhupada also warned us that there has to be a practical consideration here. We have to know our limitations in terms of our practice. Uh, and doing too much and getting exhausted and burnt out is near, not really a true devo you know, pure devotion service as people might just keep going. So I think we have to listen to our, our seniors. We have to listen to our, our team leaders. We are our, our mentors who are supervising us uh, and, and, and just find out our limitations. But at the same time, change our consciousness for, for our service. Thank you, Prabhu. So if there's no other comments, maybe the next question, if that's okay to the organizers. Okay. So the next question is also slightly related. It's very pertinent to the current situation. It's about health. So how, how do we, um, our health is such a disease that can hinder our devotional practice, physically and mentally. So how do we stay deeply connected to Krishna when we don't feel well. Mm. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna, I, I have a thought, but I'm gonna ask Maharaj, would you like to, would you like to answer that first? And then I can just add to your. <laughs> to your I don't want to sound glib or, you know, kind of just like, just cut it, but the more you find yourself in a difficult situation, then, it's just natural to, to want to call out for Krishna even more. <laughs> so, yeah, when things are going good, that's when we have our problems. Then we can get a little bit routine and get a little bit lax and start forgetting about, you know, putting quality into it. But uh, when we when things go, you know, the opposite way, just like this lockdown due to this virus, it's caused a lot of devotees to go internal more and going deeper in their own practice. So, you know, obstacles, reverses, health challenges are opportunities to um, depend on Krishna more, call out to Krishna more with feeling. And that's what Krishna likes. He likes when we depend on him. So, we there's no material impediment in devotional service so when there's challenges by way of health or whatever the challenges is it's uh we turn to krishna it's just natural even more so krishna is there Sometimes we don't experience, you know, we're calling out for Krishna and we're asking for his. He's, he's, he's actually reciprocating. We just have to learn to understand how he reciprocates. And that, that takes a little bit of an experience to see how he works in such a way to give us the strength to continue on in our, in our practice and actually also help us to see the solutions to whatever problems we're we're going through. So there's no impediment. It may feel like one, but it's not. It's just because we, we see things in a very 
black and white way. If it's not happening this way, then I mean it's not happening at all. No, for Krishna consciousness, it's always positive. There's always something we can move forward to with in any situation in our life. So, uh, yeah. So take care of your health and depend more on Krishna. That's all. <laughs> This is what we want. We want more more opportunities to call out him with feeling and more opportunities to remember him. The whole process of Krishna consciousness really centers around that one principle to always remember Krishna and never forget him. So incidents in our life are just inspirations to bring that, that reality, remembering him more and more and more. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. So thank you, Marge, for your answer. Um, I would also just add to echo what Marge said. Yeah, so just take the practical precautions. Do what you need to do to look, for, look after your health, and then we, let's channel whatever we can, as much as we can, our energy and our direction towards the Supreme Lord. One, one thing I was reflecting on recently was that so for example now we have this this pandemic but how people deal with this situation is based on what they've been doing before none of us know when we're going to leave the world so therefore a wise thing to do is to always try every day to do the best we can in our devotion as we build up our devotion in in the seemingly easier times then we can draw upon that strength that tendency, that, that willingness to take shelter of Krishna, we can draw upon that in the times where there may be some challenge. But if we don't take the opportunity when, the, when times are seemingly more stable, then when the crisis happens, and we all will go through different challenges in our lives, then when the crisis happens, then we realize that we've got nothing, we've got, we don't have so much that we can draw upon. So to Maharaj's point, that cultivation, if we practice crying out for, to Krishna, practice taking shelter of Krishna, practice learning the philosophy, doing service, if we practice that in the good times, then even if the body is in some difficulty, we will still have such a deeply ingrained tendency to connect with Krishna that we will actually, it will carry us through even physically challenging situations. You know? So we have, to, we have to consider that. Let's practice at all times, especially when things are relatively easy and we can draw upon that strength, especially when things are challenging. So I just wanted to add that to, um, to the point. If, does anyone else ha have anything to add on that question? If not, then we can go on to the next question from the organizers. Okay, so to the organizers, any, what's the next question, please? Okay, so uh, changing tact slightly, we have a question here. What is the Paribhasha Sutra from Srimad Bhagavatam, CC and Bhagavad Gita? Oh, I can't remember what it is for CC and Bhagavad Gita, although Marge may know. But Srimad Bhagavatam is 1330, um, 1328. And so we quoted it. So, so the Bhagavatam is saying that there are many incarnations of God. But then it says Krishna's two, Bhagavan Swam. Two means but. It says, but Krishna is not an incarnation. He is the original, right? Swayam. He's the original form, the original personality of Godhead. So one. 328 is the Paribha Sutra of the Srimad Bhagavatam. Um, so maybe Maharaj or Vishaka or others will know the Paribha Sutra for Bhagavad Gita or the Chaitanya Charitamrita. I have never heard directly, but I think, you know, based on my understanding of Bhagavad Gita, it's Sarva Dharma Pariksa Jam Mame Kam Sarva because after Krishna gives everything, he just says, okay, now you've heard everything, uh, just surrender. <laughs> Give up all your other ideas on how you can make advancement and just surrender to me. And the, and the principle that he teaches is the verse before that, Manmana Bhava Mad Bhakto, which he mentions twice. Always think of me, come my devotee, worship me and offer your homage to me. He says that twice in the, in the Gita. So that's the process, 1865, 934 are the process. 
And the ultimate principle of the process becomes what we say successful when we follow Sarva Dharma Pradiksa Cham. So the whole idea of Bhagavad Gita is ultimately to surrender to Krishna. And Krishna proposes that same statement later on after he says that. He says, now that you've heard everything, you can still choose what you want to do. <laughs> I've told you everything. I told I told you the whole process. I'm telling you that the goal of the process is surrender to me, but still, you can choose what you want to do. But the conclusion is surrender to Krishna. <laughs> So I would think 1866 would be the Paribhasa Sutra for Bhagavad Gita. Chaitanya Charitamrita, I, I can't think of one offhand, but I can think of, you know, the essence of Chaitanya Charitamrita is to teach the, the relationship between the living entity and the Supreme Lord through the process of pure devotional service. So you might think of verses that are that complement that particular point. So I'll I won't touch that with any kind of philosophical speculation. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just leave it. And uh, but there are many outstanding verses. Yeah. I think you know Chaitanya Charitamrita is is just all about. Hari Nam, Hari Nam, Hari Nam, Eva Kevalam, Kalon, Nasteva, 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 Gatiran, Yata. So that's philosophical speculation. It's not coming from any authority except my own, uh, you know, observation. But if someone else wants to comment on that, I would love to hear it. I'm thinking if there's no other commentary, should we maybe take one last question and then bring it to a close? I also don't want to take people over time. That question was from our... Hare Krishna? Hare Krishna? Yes, you cut out. Could you repeat that, please? That question was from... That question was from our resident monk, Jankinat Das. Ah, okay. <laughs> okay. I'll I'll just actually say something very quickly. One devotee sent me a message and said that Acharyas say that the Paribhas Sutra of Chaitanya Charitamrita is CC114 because it describes the internal reason for Mahaprabhu's advent, i.e. given the gift of Sri Radha's Mahabhav Madhurya Prem and the beautiful service of Sri Radha as her confidential maidservant. That's, that's, so someone just sent me that message. Just, We'll take one last question then, because we're mindful of the time. Unless we're okay, we can do five, 10 minutes more, if that's okay with you, with the Bhavana. Sure, yes. Okay, so the next question is, Hare Krishna Prabhu, I enjoy serving my deities at home, listening and singing to bhajans and listening to Krishna Katha. I know this isn't enough in devotional service, but by doing this, I can sustain my bhakti. Should I be doing more? Um, that's the conversation you should have with, with those who are with the devotees who you take guidance from, because they will be able to give an instruction based upon your specific circumstance or situation. So it's, it's, it's not so easy to give a very specific question, a specific answer when it's around a person's specific context without knowing what's going on in their life, what their situation is. So I think, first of all, the desire to do more, that's always healthy. The desire to want to do more service, to please the Lord more, that's fantastic. And also, there's, there's nothing wrong with acknowledging that you are doing service, that's good. That's, that's the goal of our life, to serve the Lord. But I would advise you, and if you don't, you should have people who are around you, who are further along the path, who can give guidance on, okay, now you can improve this way, or now you can expand it like this. So I think it requires personalized guidance in order to really understand how to apply this desire to do more in my specific context. So we talked about this earlier. The map of reality is a stream of Bhagavatam, 
but it's how to apply that map accurately to our specific life and that requires guidance. So I think that would be all I would say to that, unless anyone else wants to add something, Marge, Vishaka Mataji, Sundarananda or others. If not, we can go to the next question. Okay. So the next last question is from Malvika. Oh, by the way, the previous question was from Bina Mataji. So if that's answered your question, please just let us know by chat. The next question is from Malvika Mataji. She says, my question is, does the aspect of submission play a factor in understanding the scriptures and the teachings? With that being said, how do we develop that mood of submission and surrender genuinely to understand the teachings further and implement them? Very good question. Well, the first part is, does, this, does that mood of surrender um, allow us to understand the scriptures better? Yes, absolutely. Without the mood of surrender, to be honest, it's very easy to misunderstand certain things within our, within our teachings. Very easy. And it happens all the time, actually, as well. So, we, so the more we, see, the other side is this. If, we, if we're reading properly, the teachings themselves will tell us what we're meant to be doing, i.e. we're meant to be surrendering. The teachings themselves will tell us we need to um, take that shelter of a spiritual master. The teachings themselves will talk about the need to chant the holy names of the Lord. So if we're reading and understanding, we will move in that direction. And if we move in that direction, then we will actually see more and understand more in what we're reading. I'll, I'll tell you something that was very interesting. So I gave a class at the manor to, to, before the lock, before we kind of really, you know, the, the whole thing had to close down. <laughs> and I was sharing with the devotees something that I saw. I saw that devotees, when they read the scriptures, the things that stand out to them is often based upon their material conditioning, right? So because of our material conditioning, let's say I'm attached to just doing my own thing, that if I see Prabhupada says independent, thoughtful minded in Krishna consciousness, that stands out to me because it supports what I want to do, right? But the point is at the same time, I want to come closer to Krishna. All, all happiness and fulfillment is there. So it's important that I do have that guidance because with that guidance, I can understand the teachings much more deeply than, than I would otherwise. It's not, reading the books are, is important, but reading the books, if I've really understood it, the books themselves will say, you have to also take shelter of a bona fide spiritual master and make progress like that. The two things are inherently intertwined, you know? So we should, yes, if we, if we read, that will help us to surrender. And then if we surrender, it will help us to understand what we've actually read. On an initial reading, we can, we can pick up some key things. Yes, chant Hare Krishna. Krishna is the Supreme Personality of God. But to go deep into those truths, we must have guidance, actually. We must have guidance. So um, um, remind me, so the first thing was, will that help us to understand the teachings better? Yes. What was the second part of the question? If you could repeat the second part, please. Yes, second part is, how do we develop that mood of submission and surrender? genuinely to understand the teachings further. Okay, so I'll, I'll hand that over to Maharaj first, and then maybe I can just add to that. How do we develop that mood of submission and, and surrender to the spiritual master? Well, it takes faith. And if we were, if we have faith in Krishna and we have faith in Krishna's pure devotee, then yes, ya Devi para bhaktir, tata the Devi tata guru, tasyaita kartitam yatam prakasanatma mahatmanaha. One who has implicit faith in both the spiritual master and the Lord, all the imports of all Vedic knowledge automatically become revealed directly to that devotee. So that faith that implicit faith in the instructions of the Lord and the spiritual master is the foundation for developing that, that mood to go deeper. So uh, how do we build that faith? We build that faith by following their instructions. And when we get the results from 
from following their instructions, that helps to build that faith even more. So it's based on faith. The whole process of bhakti is based on faith, but that faith is strengthened by following the instructions of the spiritual master coming from the Lord. And so when we make that our life and soul, when we make that our focus in everything we do, we make that the direction that we want to go in. And uh, so if we have less than 100% faith in the spiritual master, then we won't be able to, uh, what we say, uh, remain enthusiastic in devotional service. We have to have that complete faith. But whatever the spiritual master says, and whatever he ordains for our for advancement in Krishna consciousness is guaranteed to happen as long as I can follow it. Even if I don't follow it, ideally, due to my inability to understand, still, if I'm making an effort, if I'm sincere to follow it, Krishna will make up the difference. It's faith in Guru and Krishna, which will bring the realization of the scriptures more and more alive when we approach them. Thank you for that, Maharaj. Is there anyone else who wants to add to that? Or if not, we will take any other questions. I would think it would be nice if you said something in relationship to that. <laughs> <laughs> I just gave the preliminary, so. So I think you answered very beautifully, Maharaj. The only thing I would add, I, well, not even add, I would emphasize. So, so it's also the building of a relationship. So what I've seen is that as we make sincere inquiries as we receive that direction and as we apply it it starts to have a transformative effect in our lives we, we start to practically see how by that interaction with you know those advanced seniors by that interaction we developed we had a deeper understanding a deeper insight and as we said before faith breeds faith bhakti breeds bhakti you know so as we as we make some initial attempt to inquire understand and apply it has such a powerful effect if we've done it properly you know and we've done it with the proper submission to the proper person we start to see that it does yield all kinds of amazing consequences and that becomes the foundation for us to be more in that mood of inquiry and surrender and that brings even more blessings and advancement so there's something also organic about that process if we do it wisely and I would, I would also emphasize, it's very important to have the right motive as well. As we're approaching people, as we're, we're trying to understand, it should be the right motive. And, and so the motive is important. And also we do it based upon Shastra. So we have the right understanding about what to do and how to interact with devotees. That's the first thing. Understanding is there. Second, we have the right motive. It's not because I want to get something material. I'm trying to understand Krishna. I remember there was one lecture that Bhakti Tirtha Maharaj gave and he made that point. He said, you know, Krishna is in the heart. So if you, if you have a sincere desire to progress and you're approaching with that sincere desire and you've, you've, you've read and tried to understand properly, you haven't been lazy in that sense, then there's no question that Krishna will not help because he wants us to come back to him even more than we want to come back ourselves. So it's a question of doing our part properly. So we've tried to understand how to go about the process. We, we're sincere in our desire to make progress and come closer to Krishna. And then we, on that basis, we reach out and we try to submiss submissively inquire and apply what we've learned. And that whole cycle then builds upon itself. I hope that helps or answers the question. I was, just, I was just, li uh, just listening to Prabhupada today. Prabhupada said, if you love Krishna 24 hours a day, he'll love you 26 hours a day. Oh. <laughs> so, in other words, whatever you're doing, he's always doing it in, in a greater, in greater amount and in, in greater quality. So don't think he's not reciprocating. He is and way beyond uh, what we can, you know, offer. And, and, Okay, so I think that the um, the directors are are saying they're gonna they're gonna close the um, 
the session now. So thank you very much. Thank you to Maraj, Mama Vishaka, Sundar Ananda, all of the devotees, my seniors and you know, peers, juniors. Thank you for allowing us to share something. And um, yeah, thank you for the wonderful questions, hearing and learning together. And we look forward to reconnecting when we come together for the next session as well. Okay. Thank you. And, and we'll, take the, question, Krishna. we'll take the rest of the questions in, in, in a future session. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, you. you Bhutabhava. That was wonderful. Thank you, yes. Mark, for your, for your grace and kindness. Thank you. Thank you. Amazing. Amazing.